Hello guys and gals, and welcome back to another episode of Lost Episodes. This time we sit down and uh, read quite a popular Lost Episode creepypasta called Crybaby Lane. So, like always, sit back, relax, and enjoy Crybaby Lane. In 1999, I was 22 and I had just graduated from Emerson University in downtown Boston, majoring in screenwriting, specifically in cartoons and children's programming. My debt was pretty bad, so when Nickelodeon Studios offered me an internship at Studio in California, I accepted immediately. I jumped to the chance to get away from my dead-end job at Benjamin Franklin Tour Guide. Many of you asked to see Crybaby Lane, but if you want to see the original Crybaby Lane, you never will. Even if Nickelodeon Studios somehow consents to releasing it to you, you won't be seeing what was shown on TV. And you sure as well fuck won't be seeing the original that Lauer made. I don't even think Nickelodeon has the original cut of the movie. And if they do, it's only in the backup copies. If the backup copies exist, they gotta be locked away in some vault along with the deleted episodes of Ren and Stimpy and the never-before-mentioned episodes of Spongebob Squarepants. I'm pretty sure the director, Peter Lauer, has the original copy and is probably on his mantle next to his snuff films. Creepy ass fuck. Anyways, I was hired in 1999 and immediately I was put on a creative production team for the movie Crybaby Lane. It would be almost a year before the movie was due to be broadcast. All in all, it was a pretty low effort kind of thing. There were only four people on the creative team and I was the only, you know, steady one. Lauer would replace them on a whim. Uh, he said it was to keep it fresh. I thought it was because he was hiding something. And I was right. We had a little over a year to make a TV movie. Not just to, you know, to write it, you know, cast it, but to also film it and get it edited. Lauer didn't work fast at all. After the first three weeks, we had only the ideas for the first 15 minutes of an 85-minute movie. Lauer, even at this point, you know, was a weirdo. He was tall and lanky, and he carried himself awkwardly. He stuttered when he talked, and sometimes, when you were hunched over a piece of paper during those endless brainstorming sessions, he'd look up and just, you'd catch him staring at you, smiling. He'd look away when you caught his eye. And I guess that was the creepiest part. He always looked like he had something to hide. The brainstorm sessions, at first, were all right. We got the premise of it put, uh, you know, down. Two brothers unleash a demon, and they get into mischief trying to get everything back to normal. Not exactly daytime Emmy stuff, but, you know, it was all right. I thought the movie should be goofy and spooky. Kind of like a Courage of the Cowardly Dog sort of de you know, deal. However, from the very beginning, Lauer made it clear that he wanted to film to be as scary as possible. He didn't want it to be cheap thrills with a good wholesome ending. He wanted it to push it, you know, further than Are You Afraid of the Dark, you know, ever dreamed of. And I guess he did. It was about three weeks into production when I first noticed something. Lauer had the absolute power of persuasion over everyone else in the creative production team. No one fought him. And by the third week, he was already suggesting some morbid things. I remember he said he wanted the little brother to die halfway through the movie, getting hit with a dump truck. I immediately shut it down. I was the only one who said anything. And it stayed that way until I left the studio entirely and just never came back. At first, cannibalism and other fucked up shit was kept to jokes and tasteless comments, but as time it went on, it became more and more overt. I gave him an idea of most of, you know, you know, the time he'd just end up using. Like... You know, how about the movie start with a morbid undertaker who reads them stories, to which you'd reply, yeah, and then he can cut them up into little pieces and force feed them to his dog. He made those jokes a few times in the early stages, and then he got serious. He stand up like he was Jesus or something, clear his throat loudly and proclaim his idea. I'd be the only one to shoot it down, every fucking time. One day near the end of our brainstorming sessions, Lara cleared his voice and stood up. We all fell silent and looked up at him, like we normally would. He stood up and said, Gentlemen and females, I have an idea. I remember what he did. He paused and looked right at me as he said, The story will revolve around the legend of a pair of Siamese twins. Have you ever heard of the Donner Party? Everyone nodded except for me. I didn't like where the conversation was going. They ate themselves when it got cold. <laughs> they ate each other. Everyone nodded again. I closed my eyes. Why would Siamese twins do if they had nothing to eat? Would one wait until the other twin dies and consume his own sister's flesh? Would they claw at each other's eyes until one of them died? Then dine upon them like a vulture, tearing at the skin of a dead deer? I don't know. 
It's interesting indeed. Dude, I don't know what the fuck I was hearing. I opened my eyes and looked around the room. No one was fucking moving. Everyone's eyes were on Lauer except for mine. And when I looked at him, he was still staring at me. Children like violence. They revel in it. Children like to be scared, so we'll scare him, won't we, Johnny? He leaned over the table, getting pretty damn close to my face. His breath smelled like decaying shit. I stared back at him. I think you fucked up, to be honest. He smiled and backed away. Oh, I'm fucked up alright. We have to be fucked up to survive in this cutthroat world. He, his grin expanded. Literally, right now I'm going to show you some pictures that will spark some of your imaginations. He got up and locked the door from the inside. I stood up and said, The fuck are you doing? Let's not make any errors in judgment, Jonathan. Sit down. No, sit. For some reason I did. Laura pulled out one of those shitty overhead projectors. He turned on the switch... And he speaks shouted in an unusually high and semi-frantic voice. This is the fucking news we need to continue with this pro fucking duction. This is what every child should see. His eyes bulged in his head. He put the image down on the glass surface of the overhead. It was silent. The image wasn't black and white, but it was grainy. I could vaguely make out a boy lying on a brick floor, his arms cut off and his bloody little nut black dots. The only thing that was clear was his face. He was bleeding from the mouth. Lara almost threw the paper off the overhead, slamming down another one. It was a zoomed in shot of the boy's face, it was in color. The blood trickled from his open mouth under the brick floor, his eyes shut, grimy blood underneath his eyebrows and eyelashes. Then, then his eyes opened, and I screamed. No one else in the fucking room did, and it died in infancy. The shrillness ringing in the air. The pupils were completely black. The rest of the eye was normal. The longer I stared, the more the eyes opened, widening and widening until I look at the skin above his eyebrows and the eye sockets that were going to rip in half. Then they start to bleed. Bleed? It bl blood started as a trickle. I, I swear to God, I could hear it. Now more... It was like a full-blown stream. More and more until the brick on the floor actually was a lake of blood. I could hear it. Like I was hiking and I came across a stream. And now I could smell the kid. I could fucking smell his rot! I leaned underneath the table and vomited. When I rose back up, the images were gone. Everyone else in the room was expressionless. Lauer had turned on the lights. You may go, he said, unlocking the door. I walked through those fucking doors and I never came back. This happened near the end of the brainstorming process, and by the time I left, the casting was done and the script was almost fully written. They were desperately behind schedule. I think Lauer planned it that way. So there would be no time for proper editing. I never watched the real thing when it aired, but I heard from a friend who was working in the editing department that they had to cut a good 15-20 minutes of disturbing footage from the film before it was fit to be released. And it was only fit to be released. They didn't have enough time to you know, check the footage frame by frame or anything. I guess he got his wish. Unless they cut every single scene that had the pictures in them, every child watching Crybaby Lane has an unconscious memory of those pictures. And I weep for them. I really do. They fucked me up. And as I write this to you, it'll be the last thing I'll ever write before I slip my throat and before blood splatters all over this fucking computer screen. There's something I should tell you first, though. Early on, Lauer posed an idea of the two brothers capturing a squirrel, putting said squirrel in a jar and slowly drowning it filling the jar with sand and dropping it into the bottom of the pond. Soon after this was suggested Sandy from Spongebob Squarepants that appeared in Tea at the Tree Dome. Lauer also suggested, in one scene of the movie, for a man with a squid-like nose to take off his pants in front of the two boys and raid them off camera. But heavily implied, of course. Squidward soon appeared as a major character in Spongebob Squarepants. It was suggested that the two be strep brothers forced to live in the same house after the first one's mother was found dead in a shallow grave. Her body heavily cannibalized by her own husband, a local weatherman. A show with a vague premise, Drake and Josh, started in 2004, and the stepfather is indeed a weatherman. Lauer also suggested the younger brother have a doghouse in which he keeps various animal fetuses in case an acid that he regularly uses to poison his mother to have sex with his abusive stepfather as told by Ginger debuted soon after. A man who captures the soul of the children in a vacuum cleaner and sends them to Hades. Danny Phantom. A robot who goes insane on the two brothers, kills one of them, 
wears a skin, pretending to be the dead brother at high school. My life is a teenage robot. The list goes on and on, Nickelodeon knows, and they're continuing the legacy of Lauer, sometimes subtly and sometimes very overtly. And there's nothing you and I can do about it. You want to see it? No. You got it. Now, you know what I get when I see this? I get the vibe that the person really writing this does not like his or her job. Jonathan could be a pen name, you never know. And is using this piece as some revenge article. Seems too far-fetched. Now, this is actually a popular creepypasta, and it's kind of weird. It's not scary or creepy. It's actually rather funny. Now, moving on, we'll notice that the aforementioned piece, Crybaby Lane, is an actual movie, and it's kind of forgettable. It's actually quite mature for its intended audience, which are children, and for the most part, the movie is... Again, like I said earlier, forgettable. <laughs> all it is is getting, you know, all I think it did get is just a rerun on T-Nick after claims of it being banned on Reddit and Nickelodeon just have to respond. But that's really it. I, d I don't find it that great, but that's personal opinion and a lot of other people might find it just amazing. Now see, unlike Squidward Suicide, and my god, I use that all the time, but here it works as a comparison since you're bringing up Nickelodeon, so boom boom. See, what made that one work was the fact that it felt real. Everyone working there responded realistically to what was being shown and granted, you know, could that have happened? Well, I worked in post facilities and let's be honest here. So much logging happens to the point that if someone, you know, sees something like this happening or somebody even does something close to it without anyone knowing, it's very improbable. You know, it's not going to happen. But more so forward, I noticed that the dialogue in this creepypasta by Lauer is so cliched in this that it's so laughable at certain points. And you know what these lost episode creepypastas have? Is they have finesse. And they gotta be written with great care like 1999, because these ones happen to be some of the best creepypastas out there. These run off the fact that they happen to be real, and this one is just laughably implausible. And the connections at the end are just these crazy shots in the dark that barely connect and honestly are just put in for some shock value. It's really a lost episode pasta that's popular, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's good. In the end, I always ask, what would you rate this and what would you change to make it better? There's been another episode of Lost Episodes, and if you like what you saw, then please like, comment, and subscribe. And let me know in the comments below what you would like next. These are all on suggestions, as you know. This is me, Mudahar, and I'm out.